joining us for this exciting innovation or innovative uh, initiative, the M Women at State Department. This is a truly collaborative effort between GSM Association and the U.S. Department of State. And I failed to introduce myself. I am Anita Bhatti. I am the Deputy Director for Ambassador Vivere, and that's the Secretary's Office for Global Women's Issues. And it's, it's my privilege to be here with you today. Uh, this morning, Secretary Clinton gave an important speech on why mobile technology is an important tool for women's empowerment and international development. As we all know, mobile technology is like microcredit was in the 21st century. It can help, in, mobile technology can help increase women's sense of safety, bring justice, increase women's economic opportunities, help include women in the global financial system, it can teach literacy, help with disaster relief, and improve maternal and women's health, and much more. While mobile technology is not a silver bullet to the, development, uh, to the development challenges we're facing today, it needs to be coupled with enabling environments that governments and private sector can jointly create and facilitate. This is exactly the reason why we are having this afternoon's discussions. The first panel will focus on what mobile technology can do to empower women. The second panel will address existing barriers from policies, programs, to cultural norms. And we are thrilled to have some of the best and most knowledgeable experts with us this afternoon. From the telecom industry, from government, and the uh, non-governmental sectors. We hope that this important conversation will contribute to further actions. In the State Department, we certainly hope to use our diplomacy to engage governments as we, as well as inspire private, private sector stakeholders to jointly create constructive policies, innovative programs, and, and thus creating environments to realize mobile technology's full potential. For that, I am honored to introduce the State Department's Undersecretary for Economic Energy and Agricultural Affairs, Robert Hormatz. Undersecretary Hormatz is the State Department's most senior official for all things economic. As many of you know, before joining the State Department, he was vice chair of Goldman Sachs and had been with the firm since 1982. And before his Wall Street experience, he served in the government at, right here at State Department and also USTR and the National Security Council. While he brings to state, what, sorry, what he brings to state is not only his wealth of experience, but his ability to connect macro credit or macro level economic policies to the human level and make those policies real. I have to tell one story on you under secretary at a recent policy discussion high level discussion the question was why do we want to invest in women economically and under secretary hormats looked at everyone excuse me i come from the private sector it's business it's smart business why would we not invest in 50% of our labor force why would we not train Anyway, I think I will stop here and just say that at that moment, for our office, we coined him our superstar. And I would like to invite the superstar to come to the podium. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anita, and thank uh, all of you who are here today. What a great turnout for a great topic. I see a lot of friends in the audience, and uh, it's a topic that uh, is very important to me, and I'll, I'll tell you about uh, an experience I had which illustrates this uh, in a way that really brought it home. In, it, it, in the 1960s, uh, during a time I was in uh, college, and graduate school, I spent a year in East Africa. Uh, on something that was similar to a Peace Corps. It was called Operation Crossroads Africa. And our task, this was right outside Nairobi, a place called Kiambu. 
And our task was to help local farmers build barns and fences and cow sheds and things like that. It was a great experience for a kid in college. And uh, as many of you know, in East Africa as well in many other parts of the world, women do a lot of the work, particularly do a lot of the farming and they do a lot of the marketing of the farm products. And the women I met and tended the land and uh, produced staple crops and took those to market, you know, worked, worked very, very hard. Often they traveled miles to the nearest market by themselves to sell their goods without knowing the market price that they would get when they got there and, um, or even if there would be a market. Sometimes they didn't know whether the market was open or not. They just didn't have the kind of information they needed. And years later, having had that experience, I can only imagine how different their lives would have been if they had access to today's technology, to use their phone to find the going rate for their goods before they left, or to find out what crops were in demand before the harvest, or when to harvest the products so that they could get the best value, or whether they could get the best value in this village or that village. They didn't have that kind of information. And, um, and uh, so as a result of that, this was a huge challenge for them. And if you think now how much more prosperous those women would have been, how much easier their lives would have been, it really would have made an enormous difference. So it just brought it home to me in a very, very vivid way, just how liberating a force having a cell phone and having that information is and would have been to those people. Today it's easy to take technology for granted. The devices and the pockets and the purses all across the world do more than just make phone calls. They allow us to share information. They're liberating forces for a lot of people in saving time and giving them access to information they wouldn't have had before. A mobile phone is a telephone, it's a computer, it's a database, it's a credit and debit system all rolled up into one. It allows us to build relationships, to create networks, to establish businesses that provide the backbone to our knowledge-based economy. Mobile communications technologies have been called the microcredit of the 21st century because they allow people to get access to credit, to pay their, to pay their bills, to service their credits. It's really part of a personalized banking system that you don't need bricks and mortar for, you need a cell phone for, and that has really been a, a very liberating force. And the benefits they, can, they provide can also uh, be compared to roads and ports and other physical infrastructure that sustained our industrial revolution. They're part of the information revolution. They're part of the information highway. They're critical to the flow of information and the ability to use your time and your effort more effectively and efficiently and if you saw those women taking their goods to market every so often and you saw how much work they put in, how much better would it have been if they'd known about where the best markets were and what prices they were going to get? It would have been a very liberating thing. Recent studies show that a 10% increase in mobile phone penetration rates is linked to a 1.5% increase in GDP in low and middle income countries. And that's, that's a lot when you think about it, raising the GDP that much just by introducing uh, some more cell phones. In a wide range of areas, mobile handsets provide real tangible benefits. Uh, they increase women's access to health services, they promote security and independence, and dramatically increase financial inclusion. Health services, let me just talk about that for a moment, because I think the availability of health services, particularly in rural parts, of, of the world is very limited. And yet if you have information that you can get, that you can send, or the local uh, nurse practitioner can send to doctors in larger cities to get information on health conditions, on diagnosis, on drugs, it can have an enormous benefit in, in, in dealing with uh, health issues. When I was a, a, what we call a Sherpa for the G8 summits, uh, one of the things we focused on was maternal and child health care which is one of the Millennium Development Goals. The, the, the goals there were really very far behind, and, we, and still are, although we raised a substantial amount of money. But one of the key areas is lack of information. And if you can connect nurse practitioners and clinics in rural areas with areas 
with hospitals and, and doctors in other parts of the country, you can really save a lot of lives, do a lot of very good diagnosis, and determine what kinds of medicines are use, uh, useful for certain kinds of conditions. This is an enormously powerful thing. Let me share a few examples uh, that I'm aware of, and I'm sure you're aware of many more, about how useful uh, cell phones can be. Let, let me take Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a country that has been very, very innovative in the use of cell phones, as you know, particularly for banking, but not just for banking. More than 300,000 people have enrolled in a program to learn English using their mobile, mobile phones. 300,000 people, a very substantial number, just using their cell phones. They don't have to go to a school. They can do it at home. In Kenya, a country where I lived and I'm particularly familiar with, farmers saw their income grow by as much as 30 percent after starting to util utilize mobile banking. 30 percent. Enormous benefit. And I want to tell you a very personal story because this uh, is something that you perhaps some of you are aware of, and that's a company called Ushahidi. I don't know if any of you are Swahili speakers. Ushahidi means witness. This was a company using cell phones started by a Kenyan woman. During the time that Kenya was having difficulties after a controversial election, uh, there was a lot of civil violence. And this woman, um, Oreo Kala, um, who now lives in South Africa, but was living in Kenya at the time, put together this wonderful system called Ushahidi. And what it did was everyone was given a number. And where there were acts of violence by the government against people, protesters, you would call in this number and indicate the location of the violence. And the press would come out and cover it. And it, it caused the government to, to, to have this sense of accountability because every time this happened, the press would cover it and it would be exposed. And it was a remarkable thing. And if you, if you know what the women of Ireland did to help create Irish peace, virtually the same thing happened in Kenya because of this one woman and a few of her colleagues drawing the world's attention to the violence that was occurring and focusing on it and you know naming uh, individuals or regions where they were not simply protecting the, the rights of these, of these citizens. But there's an even better part of the story later on, or at least a, a different part of the story later on, and that was Haiti. As you recall, there was a huge earthquake in Haiti not long ago. It wasn't American technology that was critical there. It was this technology developed by this Kenyan woman, Ushahidi. What did she do? She distributed information on a number to call throughout Haiti, and where, where there was a collapsed building and someone was in the building, you'd use your cell phone, you'd, you'd call this one number, and you'd say where this was, and then where did it go? There wasn't the capability in Haiti. It went to, a, to Boston, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, which happens to be my alma mater at Tufts University. There was a war room of 100 people. They would get this information, and then they would call the American military forces in Haiti and say, there's someone trapped in this building in such and such a location. Please go there and help them out. So this utilizing this information, this cell phone information, this mobile phone information, saved hundreds and hundreds of lives because this very entrepreneurial woman in, in Haiti had put this together. Um, and this is a remarkable story. And, it, and this, kind, this shows the kind of creativity in the way you can use uh, cell phones, mobile phones um, very effectively. So um, this is a, a, a way, and, and there are many, many other examples of this. And one of the things that I think is important, and I know that you're going to be talking about here and probably have already, is that there is, um, in many parts of the developing world, a gender gap with respect to phone ownership. And I think that is an extremely important thing because to the extent cell phones are liberating their devices for transmitting health information, market information, then eliminating a gender gap is a way of providing enormous opportunity for a lot of people and giving them the kind of opportunities to excel economically, to deal with the health of themselves and their families. And we also have to work with, as this woman who developed Ushahidi did, a public-private partnership where you get um, private companies engaged in this. And we're seeing this a lot in various parts of the world, that, that private companies understanding the benefits and understanding the needs and understanding the economic potential 
are going into these areas as well. Um, we have a lot more to do, and one, one of the things you're going to be talking about here is how to do it and how to do it effectively. Uh, but for a lot of women, uh, owning a mobile phone is going to be an enormously powerful thing. And my friend uh, Sherry Blair, who was here a minute ago, I don't know if she still is. Oh, um, in fact, we were at the UN just a week ago, and Sherry gave this superb report to this luncheon group on the importance of mobile phones as an economic uh, device. And I, I have to tell you, um, what she has done and her, her, her leadership and her drive and her energy in focusing on this is really superb. I think we all owe you a debt of enormous gratitude. And it's leaders like Sherry who have really um, emphasized this point and given it the kind of visibility it needs because one of the things we know about changing policy is it's not changed by timid people, it's changed by people who have the courage of their conviction and the leadership. So, well done. Um, and one of the, one of the elements that, that, that we've learned from the work she's done and her foundation has done is that um, there is this um, uh, there is this gap, uh, this gender gap with respect to cell phones, and one of the goals we should all have, certainly I believe in, is that we need to close this disparity. Uh, just let me give you one example. In South Asia, the gender gap um, between men and women in cell phones is as high as 37 percent. Think how much more development there would be in this region if, if, that, were, if that were closed. And this is going to be important. A, a lot of work is going to be done here. And I won't go into all the details because a lot of you will be, will be doing it. The report also determined that if you can really reduce this gender gap in, in cell phones, you can add you know, a huge amount uh, per year to, uh, to economic growth, particularly in developing countries. And most importantly, not just raise the GDP level, which is critically important to growth, but also have broader distribution of that growth, have more inclusive growth. And this is a critical element. Uh, Secretary Clinton uh, makes the point, and perhaps she made it this morning, I didn't have a chance to hear what she had to say, is that talent is universal and opportunity is not. Did she say that? She <laughs> says that regularly. Um, and I think one of the things we have, to, we have to realize and see is that mobile phone usage among women does provide the kind of opportunities that she's talking about, um, economic opportunities, health opportunities, opportunities to, uh, to care for their families and to uh, have a greater range of, of, of greater amount of time to devote to other things if they can use the efficiency of owning cell phones um, as, as many people do. So let me just uh, conclude by saying that when we look at the financial, the social, the cultural changes uh, that are underway. Uh, mobile communications is a, is a, critically ele a critical element of this process. And from my point of view, and I think from the point of view of my colleagues at the State Department, having all of you here and having all of you so committed to this project and trying to figure out how we can broaden the usage of mobile uh, telecommunications for people, particularly for women around the world, particularly in emerging economies, you're doing an enormous service, first of all, to the individual women who have the benefit of having access to this liberating source of information, but it is also critical to development. And if we're going to mobilize all of the best talent we have throughout the world, we need to give them the tools they need to improve the opportunities in their lives and to improve the economies and the countries in which they live. And in this knowledge age, in this knowledge, information age, a cell phone, mobile uh, telecommunications is really a critical element in this whole process. It's liberating, it produces economic growth, and it gives people opportunities that they otherwise never would have had. So I thank you very much for participating in this. I just want you to know that you have the very strongest support from, from me, from my colleagues, and uh, we look forward to following up this. This is not a one-time event. This is an event that is going to launch, hopefully, a very powerful movement that will last for a very long time and produce 
enormous benefits for a lot of people. And one of the things we have to remember in Washington or in any capital is we're not just sitting here to deal with our own interests. The only way, the only metric that really matters is how we can improve the lives of other people around the world. That's the key metric. And by doing what you're doing, you're improving the lives of a lot of people in a lot of countries. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, uh, for making the important case of uh, mobile technology and women. Now it's my pleasure to invite the private sector perspective. And we have another superstar in the person of Chris Locke um, as our next speaker. Chris is the managing director for CSMA Development Fund. As an important, as an important partner with the State Department for M Women, Chris has shown his tremendous leadership to bring this issue to the fore. We are thrilled to have GSMA with us. They represent over 800 mobile uh, telecommunication corporations around the world. And as an association, GSMA is uniquely positioned to mobilize the global tel telecom industry to recognize the potential of the, uh, the combination of women and mobile technology. Chris has had great experience working in the mobile and internet industries. He is not only interested in the business operations of those industries, but he understands the enormous social impact of information and communication technology. We thank him and his team for bringing to the State Department such important assets, and we look forward to further partner partner partnering with the team. English is really my first language. Please welcome Chris. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you, Anita, and thank you, Bob, and thank you, everyone, for coming here. It's great to see such a large crowd, and indeed, it's great to be in, in such a large room. Um, as Sherry will testify, the, the government rooms in the UK are slightly cosier than this. Um, this feels a little bit like I'm in a Stanley Kubrick film. So what we have seen since the launch of the M Women Report last February is unprecedented. The initial interest at launch was huge. In the following months, we saw momentum grow as the industry came to us asking to be involved. In six short months, we have built the largest working group for a program launch that we have ever seen, 20 operators in 115 different countries. Alongside these operators, we have support from device manufacturers such as Nokia, development agencies such as USAID, and private foundations such as the Seattle International Foundation, and of course, our invaluable partnership with the Sherry Blair Foundation for Women. This demonstrates a lot. It demonstrates that the industry recognizes both a problem, yet also the opportunity of a solution. It demonstrates that there is a real desire to use technology to improve social and economic well-being of women in the developing world. But most of all, the phenomenal response we've had demonstrates one thing, and that's scale. Our target is the largest we've ever had for a GSMA development fund program. We want to target 150 million women around the world. That's the equivalent of half the population of the United States. There is absolutely no way we would be able to achieve the scale represented by that without the partners that we've got and by the reach that they have. This shows that development goals don't have to be achieved just by the NGO sector alone or even just by the CSR teams from the private enterprises. This shows that development goals can be achieved on a massive scale by placing them right at the heart of business, a true public good allied to a private partnership. What we will be launching with our partners are large-scale activities, new tariffs, new marketing campaigns, new services, and perhaps even new devices. What we will be launching are not small-scale pilots, proof of concepts, or trials, but major campaigns targeted at and reaching millions of women. This is not development as a sideline to meet social responsibility goals. This is development as business as usual. The team within the GSMA Development Fund to achieve this goal is small, and I'd like to call them out at this stage. There's only five of them, um, Dawn, Trina, Lawrence, Sarah, and Julia. And first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for them, for everything they've done. 
I was, I was talking yesterday to Sarah, who remembers 12 months ago when she started phoning mobile operators to find out uh, their understanding of the gender segmentation split. And I think she called 10 before she got an answer. And I was saying, well, it's, it's been 12 months from her sitting in an office making those calls to everyone being here today. So it's an astonishing achievement. But the But there are only five of them, and the target is 150 million women, which gives them a great set of objectives for the next period. <laughs> only 30 million each, it's easy. <laughs> but of course, our team is just the catalyst. This target will not be achieved by our team alone, but by all our partners and by the wider industry, by everyone within this room. What we all share is a motivation to reach this target driven by the huge impact that we know our activities can have. When we released the report, and this was the first time that anyone had really quantified the gender gap in the developing world, when we released it, what inspired people to come to us and ask to participate wasn't the raw data we developed that illustrated the problem, but the stories of the women already using mobile phones to change their lives. It is in these stories that we have gained an insight into what's possible. If we can take these stories and multiply them by 150 million times, what we will have affected is a massively impactful social change. This is why we're all here today. It's from these stories that we get the inspiration to work together on these programs. Let's have a look quickly at a short film that illustrates some of those stories and shows the kind of impact that mobiles can have. Thank you. Around the world, a mobile phone is more than simply a way for a woman to connect with family and friends. Hello. It's about boosting the economy, furthering education opportunities, and improving public health. A woman should have a phone. First thing, it can be your protection. Like in this place, if I don't have a phone and yet I've been attacked by thugs, who will know? Who? No one? I'm Samanti, so this is my shop. This is the charcoal stove that I sell here. It's all clay and it's very safe. The main material is coconut charcoal made out of uh, the remaining coconut shells. I have put uh, posters all over, all in big malls with my mobile numbers on it. So at least I get about 10 calls per day. And the customers, uh, they immediately make a call standing near the post itself and then they find out where it is available, and then they come. In spite of the obvious benefits, there's still a large gender gap in terms of mobile phone ownership in low- and middle-income countries. A woman is 23% less likely than a man to own a mobile phone in Africa. A woman is 24% less likely than a man to own a mobile phone in the Middle East. And a woman is 37% less likely to own a mobile phone in South Asia. The main barrier to women having a phone is definitely the cost of access, so the initial cost of the handset. I think it's the uh, Asian culture where women are supposed to be in the home, particularly in rural areas, they're not even allowed to go out without a, a chaperone. And so really their ability to access the, uh, a phone or to buy a phone is very difficult. And it's typically the buying is done by the male in the family or the father figure and then given to the wife or the daughter. Closing the gender gap is going to be a good opportunity in bringing on new subscribers and new revenue opportunities. But there is also a um, huge social benefit in terms of providing women with access to a telephone. <laughs>
Putting phones in the hands of more women is the first step in closing this gender gap. Using these phones for new mobile-based programs that expand their opportunities is the next. I'll do the measurements now. The Child Count program uses mobile phones to facilitate and coordinate healthcare activities in Saori, Kenya. Here, local health workers send text messages to a team that closely monitors the health of the community. I read the word nine, and then I sent it to the system direct. Excuse me, boss, you have a text message. No sign of edema. The result is back. Uh, my name is Susan Wanjiko Ngigi. Uh, this is my garden. I grow cabbages and I also have a, a bit of lettuce and tomatoes. The Kenyan Farmer Helpline provides agricultural, climate and business advice to farmers via their mobile phone. I was having a problem with uh, my kills. Uh, they were yellowing too much. So they actually advised me on the, the things that I was doing wrong. I would say it builds my self-esteem because I'm able to, to contribute. The farmers around me, I also sometimes advise them. Yeah, so now with this, I have the pride that every single person looks up to me and is like, she's young and, you know, she's a farmer. Yeah. We very strongly believe in women uh, in being liberated in terms of having the ability to communicate, to be educated. The woman is the key to unlocking the wealth of the country. Uh, my phone is really very important to me. I have to have it day and night. Thank you, gentlemen. That was very good. The government and the private sector. Please give them another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now it is my pleasure to invite Mara, Mara O'Neill from the U.S. Uh, Department of AID. She is going to be uh, moderating a uh, panel. And just so you know who this important lady is, she is the chief innovation officer for our development agency. So take it away. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank Anita. You. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite our panelists up. Uh, um, and so as they're um, getting seated, let me tell you that we, um, I've told them that I want to simulate a conversation around a dinner table here because I think that's the most interesting. So I encourage them to interrupt each other, disagree. I may actually uh, interrupt and move us on, but we hope we'll make it lively. But we'd also like to engage you. I know we're running a little behind, but I want you to ask that question that uh, is worrying you about how it is that we get this 150 women or more access to mobile phones, or what are some of the cultural issues, or what are some of the uh, technologies technology issues that uh, will break those barriers. So let me tell you who that we have an, just a really awesome panel today. But before that, I'm also happy to announce that this morning USAID and GSMA um, signed a memorandum of understanding to become partners in having this mobile um, gender divide over the next three years. So we're delighted and uh, um, to be partners in doing that worldwide. <laughs> So we have uh, lots of uh, um, really wonderful panelists from both the public and private sector and civil society. Um, all the way down at the end is Rajiv Bawa, he's Executive Vice President of Corporate Affairs for Uninor, a mobile um, telephony company based in India. Next to him is Ellen Blackler, who's the Executive Director of Regulatory Planning and Policy at AT&T, um, one of those uh, landline companies that reinvented themselves along the way and become a global force. Um, the, the next one is Trina Dasgupta, and she is one of that uh, one of Chris's teams that's making this thing happen uh, globally on uh, on uh, um, the Mobile Women Program uh, Director. Next to her is Yvette. And I actually had her spell her name uh, out phonetically for me, Albert Dink Tim. So, uh, and uh, she's executive director of Witness and has just a um, whole lot of background in 
MTV and other ways of using emerging technologies to engage in a global conversation about human rights, um, both on the private sector and now in the public sector. And to my immediate left is David Alwood, the executive director of the M Alliance for the UN Foundation, who I think has some really interesting things to talk to us about, about how do we take what's happened on the internet and happened on mobile and really enable it to be a force for good and health and what some of the particular challenges are of that. But let's, let, uh, I would, I'd like to start out with you, Yvette, today because we saw some of the power of what, uh, uh, what women, how women care about this. So fast forward to us, tell us how the world would be different um, for women and for poor people if we had more ubiquity um, with respect to gender and mobile phones. Sorry, technology. <laughs> uh, WITNESS is a human rights organization that was founded 20 years ago on the notion of what if every human rights defender had a camera in their hands, what would they film and what could they change? So we started originally by packaging up video cameras and sending them to other sides of the world to help people document their stories. The notion is that visual imagery has a unique uh, power to move people to action. Um, in the past 20 years, we've trained over 80 grassroots organizations to use video to document human rights violations and to use personal stories of abuse to turn them into powerful tools for justice. Um, we've trained thousands of human rights defenders. Now, fast forward to the suggestion to today's world where over, I think there's a little bit over 5 billion um, mobiles are in the hands of people. A lot of those and an increasing amount of those are video enabled. So the question now is not just about the traditional human rights defender, but what if every citizen who now have these mobiles in their hands, what could they actually document and what could they change? Um, so one of the interesting things uh, is that we've just started to a new campaign uh, that's addressing gender-based violence in conflict zones. And I was talking to uh, our partner about this, which is called the Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice. They are a, a big coalition of 150 grassroots organizations in um, uh, uh, countries that are being investigated by the ICC. So it's Congo, Central African Republic, um, Uganda, and Kenya. And I asked her, she was in our office yesterday, I said, what does mobile mean to women who are really the grassroots human, or human rights defenders on the ground. And she said, in the most basic, simple way, it is an incredible organizing and mobilizing tool. So that we could not do our work unless we had mobile phones. Because if you're a woman sitting in the north of Congo and you need to talk to someone in the south of Congo, there's no way you can actually get together and do this. So the way that the actions and the human rights campaigns are being organized is simply by everybody getting on their mobile phones with with, as she added, a little bit of training around how to actually be, have 35 different people on one conference well, call. Let me, let me just ask you a follow-up to that. Um, a woman who has been violated or has um, been the witness to some atrocity, either on her or on somebody else, um, it's a scary moment. And the notion that somehow they would put that forward and then be victimized yeah. further by that. Speak to that issue a bit. Um, yeah, and that's actually a really important issue. So technology is both an incredibly empowering thing, and it is very, the whole notion that someone can tell their own personal story of abuse, and then that turns them from victims of human rights um, abuses into people who actually can take action. However, think, for example, about the picture of Neda, the woman uh, who was murdered during the uh, Iranian demonstrations, there are issues of privacy and there are issues of safety and consent. Did her family, was her family okay with her image going all over the, over the internet? So while it's amazing if you look at what uh, the students in Iran did to organize themselves and how much transparency that actually creates and how these images are being used to hold governments accountable, which is amazing. You also have to really think about the, the moment you would actually distribute or redistribute that video via Twitter or online. Has that person actually consented to their image 
are you further endangering possibly the woman who is actually in that video? Um, or the Iranian government has a most wanted website where they're actually scraping videos of YouTube and using the images that they find via YouTube to track down and to arrest uh, people who've been demonstrating. So, so I think it's a, it's a fine balance yep. and it's really important to think and to train To pay people. attention to that and, and, uh, and not dismiss it as yeah. all publicity is good, that uh, we care about women being safe first and foremost. So thanks. Rajiv, one of the things about today is it's, it, it's inspiring, it's groundbreaking, but you and I had an interesting conversation about how do you not make this just a snapshot, just a good opportunity? How do you develop sustainable programs so that we're here five years from now and that mobile gender gap really is cut in half or even better than that? And uh, so tell us what you're thinking as a private company, as how you approach that, what ideas you have, and what suggestions you have for all of us to make this effort sustainable. <clears throat> Mona, let me let me start by giving you a little bit of a of a, of a rundown on what we what we did, and then answer your question a little bit more specifically. We're a very new company in India. Uh, India is a very crowded market, a market that has over 10 plus telecom operators. We've just launched eight nine months ago, actually 10 months to be precise. When we started, we took the approach that... Have you gotten uh, any sleep in that time? Uh, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> uh, so since we started, we took the approach of, uh, of doing things a little differently. We wanted to, uh, while we wanted to launch our service, naturally it's something we want to do as a business and we want to make money. So that's why we were doing this. But we wanted to create an environment which we believed was a little bit different. And as we take our service into the market, we wanted to do something uh, which, in, which takes us in line with the way the community is and, and way people use telecommunication to change their lives. And so, how do women use telecommunications differently, have you found, um, than men? Well, firstly, when we started, we realized that there's a big gender gap uh, in India. There were two things we found out. One was the gender gap is pretty large. We heard some numbers today, 37, 35 percent. One can argue whether in India it's exactly that or more, but it's pretty large. But it's uh, bad. And it's bad. Number one. Number two, the digital divide between urban and rural India is also very high. So we took these two factors and the fact that we wanted to bring in a, uh, telecommunication as a service and make people, specifically women, more empowered in what they did. When we launched, we created a, a tagline for our brand. And in Hindi, it's ab mera number hai, or in English, it means it's my turn now. So we took that approach into the market. And as we were uh, launching our services, we were looking for a partnership with somebody that was already in market as an NGO that looked at the rural India market and looked at women and, and wanted to tie in the third angle, which is where we came in, which is telecommunication. So we found a company called Hand in Hand, which has uh, a lot of work uh, being done already empowering women. And we started a pilot program in the July time frame where we picked 50 centers that uh, Hand in Hand was going to fund through microfinance. And, and, and the model really is very simple. It's to take women and make them more empowered to create better income generating opportunities for them. We came in as a telecom operator with the notion that why don't we help this cause and reduce the, the A, the gender gap and B, the digital divide between rural and, and urban and, and came with the idea of bringing in technology into this or communication into this, help them set up in these centers um, uh, internet connectivity, which uh, is where we came into play, and took it a step further to say that in a while, these women can now use uh, communication to increase their income. Why don't we also add more education to empower them further and, and help them be true entrepreneurs? So traditionally, they would have gone and opened a shop and became a retailer, which anybody can do. But why don't we take this as an opportunity to take it really in a different way so, and add more uh, capabilities of empowering them, bringing them uh, into a sustainable model right. where we could uh, educate them beyond just giving them something uh, like, a, like a computer or an right. internet connection. So if I hear you, um, Rajiv, if I'm understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that your basically market development is around entrepreneurial development of these women, is it, to say, it, if we can help them understand how they can economically be empowered by this phone, they can be long-term customers. Is that really the, the message? 
In, in some ways it is. What, what we really wanted to do was, traditionally in India, women are always uh, deprived. Uh, women don't have much of a say in what they want to do. This was a way to, to say that, uh, you know, let's help you uh, become empowered. Let's help you generate your income in a little different way. Let's make you a true entrepreneur. And let's help you using technology, communication, to, to take you to a different level where it can actually help and increase your income. So yeah. in three, four months, what we found was these 50 women, their income has gone up 30 35% because they're using communication now to add more uh, ways of generating their income. As an example, all of them now offer ICT training. This is after they've been trained. They then further train women in their communities. So each of yeah. them roughly trains anywhere from 10 to 20 women on a given week. It's a two-week program, at the end of which those women that are trained receive a certificate, and then they can decide to do the same. So it's a, it's a, it's a model where you start with 50, and in three months, this has touched about 4,000 women who've Fantastic. been trained. And we, on top of it, are running courses on the side where we are bringing right to information uh, technology, teaching them about you know, what that is, teaching them about health, uh, health safety and environment. So working with them, to take it beyond just the centers we work in and, and actually kind of make it a spiral effect cool. and cool. Then make them important. So Trina actually pushed her microphone halfway through, so she wants to jump in here. What do you want to share with us? Well, I just want to share that I think what's important to understand around this dialogue, we're going to hear a lot of beautiful stories that are really important, but the segmenting of the women's market in the mobile industry actually hasn't happened across the board. And I think, you know, what Chris said um, in his speech to me is just so incredibly important is that this is e equally about the business case as it is about the great story and the empowerment. The mobile industry is a relatively new industry in the grand scheme of things. And so what's been happening across the board is the the dramatic um, increase is around a prepaid market where you don't have a lot of data. People don't know necessarily who their consumers are, you know, where they're coming from. The reason the report that the GSMA did with the Sheree Blair Foundation was so tremendously eye-opening is because no one knew. No one knew that women were 37% less likely to have a phone in India. And so what we're, what we're doing, what we're trying to do here today is we're building the business case in as much as we're de delivering against those development goals. And I think if we don't do that, it's not going to. Yeah, I think that's really important. I grew up in a time where um, all the pitch people and all the marketing was to men because they sort of, men were writing it, they assumed that was. And then in the late 70s, a woman who was the head of an advertising agency came out with a report that said 80% of all consumer purchases are made by women. This was a shocking thing on advertising on Madison <laughs> Avenue. Yeah. I thought, did they walk in any household? Did they walk in any grocery yeah. store? So I think the point Trina is making is really important is that left to the own market development, unless we begin to really show what role women can play, what the difference is, what the value added, um, that in fact uh, it turns out that women buy most of the cars and houses as well as the washing machines. So I think that's a really important thing that we all can work together to build, begin to build that business case. So Ellen, I'd like you to grab you in here because um, the history of the landline telecommunications has been fraught with regulatory constraints um, worldwide, and that has been slow to get uh, landlines in addition to the capital requirements. Clearly a very different thing with mobile, and yet I would bet that you and your uh, uh, colleagues have not been put out of business, meaning that there still remains regulatory and policy issues either for greater penetration of mobile, but particularly since we're talking about women today, what role or what issues would keep you awake at night if GSMA said, we want to break this barrier um, of women's access and we need your help to do it? Well, I think it all comes down to really an understanding of the market, and that's what, you know, as Trina pointed out, was I think kind of groundbreaking is it really exposes what has always been a market opportunity. And so the hope is that companies can work with that. And going back to the, the, the point you made earlier is how do we make this um, sustainable and not just kind of today's So issue. what ideas do you have for us, on all of us, on making it sustainable and not just, a, not just a, these warm stories that are so compelling? 
So I think it's the data. I mean, I think the, the reason that you have so much company interest is in this is that the data is so compelling. When you look at this data and see the size of this market and this huge gap, and this does not take uh, us inventing something new. You know, okay. these are, in many cases, the lowest end phone technology we have. So to use it every day, we know how to do it. And that is why it's such a great opportunity and why it seems such a solvable yeah. uh, problem. Yeah. So one of the things that everybody talks about, um, um, about the disruptive technology of mobile and how game changing it can be is on the identification and delivery of health services. Um, and so David, you and I were talking about some of the particular challenges about harnessing this technology on behalf of women in the health area. So help us understand that and help us think about what some of the solutions might be. Thank you. Um, and I'm honored to be here. I, I, I just want to pay a little tr side tribute. Uh, the reason we're here is because most countries got the policy issue right. Most countries had more than one wireless carrier, and as a result, we had competition. As a result, we have uh, five billion wireless subscribers, and therefore, we have a conversation here. And it's led by Milan Verveer, and it was her husband who, more than any other individual in this country, uh, made that policy decision and made it happen in the late 70s. So uh, while Phil is not here, he's at the ITU, I just wanted to note that it was Phil Verveer who really got this started. And, and so that shows also, I think, that the a key that, yes, the government gets a policy issue right, although there are some countries that still think wireless is a luxury and they're taxing it at 40%, which discourages women from buying it. But, but beyond that, in order to use it, it becomes a public-private set of issues. It's, it's the government gets the policy right, the private sector invests the money, and then the healthcare people need to get involved. And, Suddenly what's happening is that global public health community is looking around saying, my God, people are carrying these things in their hands. What can we do with that? And uh, there are examples around the world of people doing neat things with that, uh, individual specific things that add value. And we saw that in the United States 20 years ago. Uh, people started to use computers and, and then later cell phones in healthcare. The challenge is not to do neat things. The challenge is to all come together and figure out what the sustainable models are that really make a difference in health. Not that are cool technically, but make a really big difference in health and that make sense economically to the full chain. And you can only do that if you get the full chain around the table. And that's what's so brilliant about uh, what GSMA and state are doing here uh, is they're starting that conversation and, and bringing people together because this is not uh, It's not a private sector thing. It's not it's not a public sector thing, but it, we all got to get it right, right? We, we all got to get it right. We got to get it together because if we don't we're going to replicate the United States in health IT in the developing world and that would be a disaster. So give us some specific, uh, so we can all agree on that not being the end state we'd like to get to. So, but help us, you know, I, I, I'm a technologist, but, uh, but I don't spend my life in health care. So give us some specific ideas about how we're going to get from here to there. If the existing system is, isn't the way we want to go, what is? Well, let's start with really simple stuff. Why does a woman want to have a cell phone? Because it gives her access to information. It gives her power. It gives her an ability to reach out and get the information she needs to protect herself and her kids. Uh, so first, what is it we can do in healthcare that gets her access to information? And we're seeing 24 by 7 uh, call lines be very successful in the developing world. Second, what are the simple blocking and tackling things that, that are useful to deliver healthcare efficiently? Appointments, reminders, simple health records, simple basic stuff that will cause me uh, uh, as a husband uh, or a woman to say, I need one of these things. I need this subscription and I will keep adding uh, value. 65% of the healthcare expenditures in the developing world are out of pocket expenses. People are spending money on disposable income on cell phones and they'll spend it on health care. So if we start with simple accessible information uh, then let's go to the people who are providers. There are people who are frontline providers of health care who are not trained nurses. They're community health workers, midwives, people who don't get the kind of training they need but we can put training in their hands. We can put information in their hands. 
We can put checklists in their hands. I don't know how many of you know, but there's a significant cause of death of babies in sub-Saharan Africa is freezing to death. How a baby in sub-Saharan Africa freezes to death, I find personally offensive. And they freeze to death because people don't know that you shouldn't wash them and hold them up when they're preemies. Uh, they should be wrapped to the woman's chest. That's just a simple piece of information that we can put in the hands of everybody. So I think what we need to do is get around the table as we're starting to do. I mean, this is, not, this is a really exciting time because people are coming around the table and saying, all right, you're the expert on maternal care. What kinds of ICT can we give you and the, and the person next to you? And that makes sense from an economic point of view. Uh, and let's start deploying those at scale. Great. Uh, so let me, let me just throw one question out to the whole panel. But while I'm doing that, I'd invite you all to think, and uh, let's grab you in the conversation as well. So David said, talked about, and we know that what an incredibly empowering um, device this is. But there's a lot of traditional attitudes and cultural belief systems that aren't necessarily thrilled about women having more power, scared about what that that means. So how do we how do we simultaneously while we're building business models, while we're building apps that are that are have to have apps rather than nice to, how do we deal with some of those traditional and cultural attitudes that if we don't get over, we won't uh, build that divide. We won't cross that divide. So one of the things we've seen um, with our working group and our operators is that they know their market better than anybody else. They've done the market research, they live in the communities, they know what's necessary. And one of the great examples we've seen in Afghanistan with Roshan, who we've heard a little bit from today, is they created a culturally relevant marketing campaign. We know there are very serious gender issues in Afghanistan. And what they did was they said, well, we know men are the purchasers. Women don't have the money to, to buy the phones. We need to get to the men. How do we position the phone in a way that it's not a liability, but rather a good thing that, that women should have? And when they started this marketing campaign, they were at a 6% penetration rate amongst women. And what the marketing campaign did was that it positioned men as the gift bearer of the phone. They gifted security to their wives and their children. And then they attached a friends and family tariff to that marketing plan. So they said, what we're saying is gift security and the people that your wives are gonna be in touch with are these five people. So this is not gonna get out of control. She is not suddenly going to become an American teenager, access to all this information, texting all the time. This is, this is very controlled and this is what is appropriate in our culture. And in doing that, they went from a 6% penetration rate to a 23% penetration rate in six months. Wow, fantastic. And so we know, we know that we can do that. We also know in many developing countries, mobile operators have the largest marketing budgets. And they have, it holds a lot of the media. And so that's the conversation that we're having is why is it beneficial for you to make that spend, to not only make that cultural shift, but also to gain the returns on that market research and that, mar uh, and that spend so that the women can have the phones to get the services that everyone here is talking Great. about today. Anybody else want to jump in? Sorry. Uh, I agree with Trina. I think a lot of it uh, ends up becoming um, very local pretty fast. So if we take India as an example, in fact, what we've seen is that even within our country, it's a little different based on where you are on that cultural divide. As an example, this uh, pilot that we're doing is in the southern part of India, because in southern part of India, the education or literacy rate is higher. So in that case, it was easier for us to work with women because it was almost uh, you know, people understood that it's once they get empowered, they can generate income. It's a good way for them and their families and the societies. Whereas if we tried the same exact program in maybe a different part of India, perhaps northern India, it would not work in that way. So a lot of times you have to look at the local issues and then see how exactly do you want to tackle it in those markets and tweak, uh, tweak it a little bit to suit those needs and then set up programs based on that that work and are sustainable. Great. Okay. And one of the things I, yeah. would, I would add more to that is that it, parts of it are local and parts of it are global, and we need to get it right. Uh, one of the things that we found uh, at the M Health Alliance, uh, we were kind of set up to, to help figure out, is a lack of information sharing. There are people in Kenya who are taking on exactly the same issue in Peru, and neither knows what the other is doing. Okay. And so, so there's a lot of coming together and sharing ideas uh, that need that really needs to happen. And it seems to me that mobile is a 
fantastic way to disseminate that information quickly. So we got to figure out, as you say, David, some ways to have that interconnection. So when information is available, like the um, uh, best practices around your newborn infant, that that can be uh, shared more widely. Okay, so um, we've been having a good time around this dinner uh, table, but would like to grab you in there. So if you have a question or if you just violently disagree with something the panelists said, that's okay too. We're all a family. Okay, how about this person back here? If you can go up to the um, mic, that'd be great. And if you could tell us what your name is and who, where you're from, it would be great. Sure. Is this on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Um, I'm Linda Raptor, and I work at Plan International. And my question is if we also need to start at an earlier age, um, and that we've heard that it's important to involve men and boys, and we've heard at the CGI and all the meetings in New York the importance of involving adolescent girls and investing in adolescent girls. So my question is how can we also look at a younger age, how can we look at the education that girls are getting and think about how girls can have access to phones but also build their skills to be involved in designing, Great. developing, and engaging in the tech That's sector. That's a terrific question. So who wants to jump in on that one? Well, look what happened in this country. Uh, I remember buying cell phones for my daughters uh, for safety so they could call 911. Uh, I don't think they either of them ever called 911 in their lives, but but uh, uh, as but it, the, but it got their dad to buy them a phone. It, yeah, they got them a phone. And Great market. As that market got got saturated, the American carriers moved down so that a third or uh, of the kids between eight and 12 have cell phones now. Uh, I was in Limpopo province in South Africa, and there are teenage girls walking along the, the, the highway. There's no power lines, and they're and they're texting away. So I think adolescent girls is exactly the right place to focus for a whole set of reasons. Uh, and what, maybe what it's what Rajiv said, that if, uh, as you say, David, focus on that, but focus on what somebody who would buy that phone would care about them. Not necessarily what that teenager would like, but what's going to get the, that phone in their hands. Anybody else want to well, jump in on this I think one? The key, the key part of that question is about access. And the idea of the M Women program is that it's an unprecedented private-public partnership. We are not experts in designing programs for adolescent girls. Plan is. And so the idea is we can bring the mobile industry to the table and say, okay, Plan, what do we need to do for adolescent girls in Kenya, for example? What is the program that you have? How do we incorporate the mobile channel? The mobile channel is not the only channel. It's a great, new, exciting channel where we're able to access the most number of people. But what we bring to the table is to say, OK, well, we understand mobile. You have your program. Let's find where the linkages are and the complements are so that we can work together. On, on, and just you know, reiterating what David said, the business case we're working on, it's very clear that you know, the entry point to a market is teenage girls. You know, everybody knows that you know, Japanese girls invented text messaging, basically, you know, and Great. using um, beepers at the time. Okay. So th this is all about, I, I, I joke, but it's true. I feel like the planet's aligned today. And I feel like you know, it's, it's a unique moment where, where it doesn't happen where everybody's interests are in the same place. So it's about having that dialogue and so how we ha make it happen together. Great. How about this? Uh... Hi, I'm Amy Kay. I'm with the Center for Development and um, Population Activities. I'd like to know a little bit more about what work you've done with low literacy audiences, because I, I perceive some of these technologies as requiring a certain base of literacy, and perhaps what you've done with that, and also resource constrained settings, particularly if there's not a, a reliable source of electricity. Okay. Do you want to start with that? I can give you one um, example. Is that we're doing a campaign in India together with a local partner called Chinten to protect the rights of garbage uh, pickers which are, there's police brutality against them, and it's also, it's a, it's a right to labor, a right to work uh, issue. And they are highly, they're completely, uh, most of them are completely illiterate, but they're highly organized via their mobile phones. In fact, it's, it's unbelievable that, that something like 30% uh, of the entire garbage system in Delhi is organized via text messaging by people who are not necessarily literate. So my sense is that um, media literacy via phones is not the same. Even the word literacy is not maybe the right word to use. And then if when you put the right tools in the hands of people, they can use them in a very powerful way. And obviously, for us, using them with visual imagery is, is a very different kind of literacy. 
Okay. I, I'd Mom? add two things that the, the um, voice to text, text to voice, uh, we're finding uh, works very well for, for people there. And then secondly, as, as the gentleman said earlier, uh, cell phone companies tend to be the largest power producers in a lot of these countries in the rural areas. And there's a major program going on by the cellular industry to extend that power, excess power into the villages, uh, which is extremely exciting. So, mm -hmm. so I think there's progress can be made on both very quickly. There's also very cool um, solar lanterns that are photovoltaics that have uh, um, cell phone rechargers built in as well. So we're interested in uh, propagating um, women solar entrepreneurs that will do that same sort of thing. Molly. Can you tell everybody who you are? Can you? My name is Molly Nelson. I'm the director of SOSAN, which is a non-governmental organization working on empowering education in the community. And I just want to address several things that were brought up very quickly. Uh, we use human rights education in the first year of our program, of our education program, to try to work on the issues related to uh, social norms, where men normally not let their wives even work or travel or have cell phones or have the other lessons. three years ago, uh, teaching literacy through the cell phone. So they actually uh, are, as they learn letters, when they get to 10 letters, they actually start, um, after having also learned about navigation and being able to go to where you write messages, use their literacy on the cell phone. Cool. And now it's, it's really amazing how that has, has uh, worked. Right. And then one more point. OK, I quickly. It's important is that uh, most of our villages don't have electricity. So we have solar suitcases where they can uh, actually have a business. After three months, they pay for the suitcases, and that's where they charge their phones. And we give phones, we give 15 when we're teaching literacy to make sure that those girls and the women will continue to have access to those phones because those are their phones after we leave the community. And they have a business around those 15 phones of women coming in using the the solar suitcases to charge the phones. Okay, so I just got my um, dong, which means we have uh, time for one more question and then think about anything very quickly as a panelist that you said, I came here and the most important thing I wanted to say is thus and I forgot or didn't have an opportunity. So I'll give you all just a quick moment, but we'll just do one more question here and then we're gonna take a break for about 20 minutes and so you can come up and talk to the panelists, talk to each other and continue this conversation. So tell us who you are and um, what you want to um, share with us today. Uh, my name is Carl Morrison. I'm with a relatively new NGO focusing on uh, rural women in uh, uh, natural resource management, mostly in Africa, called New Course. And uh, my question sort of dovetails a little with a couple of the other ones. Uh, we work mostly in very uh, remote uh, areas and how much, I'm looking at some of the applications in terms of health agriculture, uh, income generation, it seems like th there could be a lot of opportunities in, in some very rural areas, but uh, coverage and the, do we have to wait for the, the market to be there for private companies to come in and provide the, the coverage? Um, or are there other innovative ways where we can get um, more access to very remote villages? Okay. Anybody want to take that? David, you want to? We have limited resources um, uh, to address public needs. Uh, what it, it, something extraordinary has happened is that it's almost 95 to 99 percent private capital are, are building these networks, um, and frankly, and it, it's expanding really fast. So I would let it go, uh, and and us focus on the use of those networks, uh, which are covering more than 85 percent of the world's population right now. And if at the end of the day we'll find some communities that aren't reached, and okay, then let's address those. But for now, I think the challenge is how to use those networks properly, 
and, and the, the, the one thing I wanted to say is that I think the United States government, I'm, I'm really proud of my government for leading in this way. I'm really not proud of my government for not getting its act together in lots of other ways in this area. <laughs> we are spending billions of dollars in foreign aid and we do not require people to use efficient information and communications technologies in doing that. We're and, working on that, David. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we got to close up, but let me, um, so, uh, so my husband once told me best to leave a party one hour too early than one hour too late. So, uh, uh, so I think this has been a fantastic conversation and I want you to continue to pursue pursue this with David and with the rest of the panelists. Anybody else want to have one last uh, speed uh, comment? Well, um, one I just wanted to say that the GSMA has a fantastic rural development project that's underway where we've done an analysis of where is left in the world um, to get coverage and it's happening and it's happening very soon and there's a great business case for it. But the other thing I wanted to, to say is to encourage everyone to visit mwomen.org which is a community site to have this dialogue. We know there's not enough time to do this today. And so the idea is for everyone to join, register, discuss. It's a, it's a Wikipedia-based site um, because we want this, this community to, to grow and learn. So please visit mwomen.org. Yeah. Well, on that note, um, join me in thanking um, just a, a particularly thoughtful group of people today. Asenal Shaw from the White House is going to moderate the next panel, and uh, we have an equally engaging group of people. So we hope you'll hang out for 15 or 20 minutes, get to know the people who are here, and join us back. Thank you.